Texas and City Hall. Now you may be asking yourself, Turner, why are we having to talk about local government? This is an environmental science class. And you're right, this is an environmental science class. But what you may not realize is that local cities are all about environmental science. There's a lot more to a city than just police and fire protection telling you where you can't build a building, which actually even telling you where you can't build a building has to do with environmental science. What I want you to realize and learn from this lab is that local cities are some of the most cutting edge people when it comes to the studies of the environment because they have to provide all the basic needs to you and to me. Everything from protecting our property, which is like step one, but also providing for our basic needs like water, making sure that our shelters and our investments stay secure by telling us we can't build in a floodplain. Local cities have so much that they have to think about in order to function. And most of it revolves around how to properly control the environment to provide for a sustainable population. That's why they tell you where you can and can't build your building or your house. Now, today I have a special speaker for you, somebody who I really want you to listen to. He is associated with the city of Hewitt. He's been the mayor of Hewitt several times. He's been mayor pro tem of Hewitt. He's been on the council, city council. He's been on the board of adjustment as chairman for a while. Close to 30 years, this guy has been involved with local government politics. And whenever I have a question about cities and the environment, he's the guy I call. He also, coincidentally, happens to be my dad. That's right, Charles D, or Charlie Turner, is my father, and he is a very active member in Hewitt politics. He's either been mayor, mayor pro tem, Hewitt City Councilman, or chairman of their Board of Adjustment since before I was even born. So, I want you to go ahead and say hello to my dad, Charlie Turner. But wait, before we do, I want you to realize, I didn't just call him up and say, hey, I need somebody to do a lab. I'll let my dad do it. My students won't know that, you know, he doesn't know what's going on. Au contraire, my dad knows what's going on. And that's one reason why I can't think of anybody better than him to do this lab. So, I now give to you the expertise of my dad, Charlie Turner. Hello. As Brad said before, I am his dad. And also, my name is Charlie Turner. I've been associated with the city of Hewitt since 1981 when I won my first election. I've been on committees before that, but really my involvement started in 1981. I'd like to invite you to come visit our city today because we have a lot of things we'd like to show you. I want to go through and tell you how a city impacts you in an environmental science class today. And the best part about it of all is you get college credit for this. You get to go see our town, you get to meet our people, you get to see how things have been made better. And in some cases, maybe a little worse, but for the betterment of everybody. You gotta look at that big picture. So I invite you to come with me today and go around with me to Hewitt. We'll stop off at several places and I'll tell you fun facts about it as well as introduce you to why city government and your local city government is so important to you and your environment. Because just like where I'm standing today, my first trip out to Hewitt was in 1971 when a friend of mine bought a house out here. I didn't even remember Hewitt being here because it was just a farm community, but I'll tell you this much, I was dove hunting right here where I'm standing, and if I tried that today, well, the police department's just right there, and let's just say I'd be uh, visiting on the county for a while, which I don't want to do that. So, come join me today, and let's go have some fun, let's look around, let's learn some things, and let's see how Hewitt has changed from the 1880s when it was founded as a little farming community to right now, past the millennium, so that we know how our environment gets impacted by all the things that your local city government does. So come on, let's go see Hewitt. Well, here we are in Warren Park. Warren Park was the first park that Hewitt ever received. 
and we got it around the mid 1980s and actually how all parks develop because cities love to have parks it's the area that we leave naturally for the environment and all the little displaced animals and all and all the things that were taken away from their home when we develop our housing and all but it actually benefits people as well because most builders go out and buy a large tract of land and in buying this large tract of land it's like buying a whole house full of furniture there's going to be things in there that you really love and they're going to be keepsakes and heirlooms and then there's going to be stuff that you really didn't want and what the builders find out is when they buy the family farms is usually how it gets started when everyone's ready to split up the inheritance they get a lot of land that they can develop and put people's homes on it but they also get a lot of land that they can't sell and they can't develop and they can't do anything with because it's called a floodplain. Now let me explain how a floodplain works. A floodplain is the kind of area, and as you can see behind me, there are trees here. There's actually a Castleman Creek running through as well. And it is areas that you could not build a house even if you wanted to because banks will not loan money because it is prone to have problems with flooding and all the other problems that come along with that so builders being the smart guys they are decided there is a way we can both have a win-win situation actually it would be a win-win-win the builder wins in that he gets full value for his property the city wins in that people have a nice park to bring their families and picnic like this big pavilion we're sitting or uh, standing under at the moment. And then it's a win for the environment because the places that were displaced were the small animals and the native grasses and the, as you can see the woodland and the water. Well it now has its place in Hewitt as well. And that's how most cities acquire their parks. Hewitt has been fortunate in that we had this park develop and usually a town of our size and we're approximately somewhere under 25,000 population which will be our max build out when we're through but Hewitt has been very fortunate in that we have Warren Park and then you probably have seen Hewitt Park over on Hewitt Drive or Highway 1695 for you map people but they, we received that one in the same way that we received this one. It was in a floodplain, and the builder gets the full value of the land where before it might have been just a worthless purchase to them. Now, let's take a look at a few things here in this park, like Castleman Creek. Castleman Creek serves the city in that when it rains and everything, because there's been so much development, the ground can't take all the water in quickly because there is concrete where I'm standing, there's asphalt, there is a road there. There are all sorts of things that people have put here to make our lives better. And I, <laughs> there's even a restroom up there, which we definitely don't want that floating down inside the ground. But people, it makes people's lives better. We have a playground here, but in doing so, we disturb the environment and yet we give the environment a place for, as you would say, to live and breathe and be a part of what our lives are about. Because no one wants to live in the middle of a cold, hard city. And if you take a look out here at Castleman Creek, you have the water drainage where it can all go and flow naturally out of the city without damaging the homes, without damaging people's lives in any form or fashion, destroying their property or God forbid, even one of them getting injured or killed. The floodplain areas, though they sound bad when you're first talking about them for builders, are actually something very, very good for the environment and the city and the people that live in it. If I can take a moment, I'm going to give you a couple little quick facts, and I'll be giving you a couple more about Hewitt Park here. Now, some of y'all, or most of you, are probably too young to remember drive-ins. I remember drive-ins because... They had a big screen there, you would pull your car in, you'd park on the side of what looked like a little hill, put a speaker on the side of your car window, which y'all probably wouldn't want to listen to because it was you know, like that. But they'd watch movies and they broadcast at one time and instead of going into theaters, you just stayed in your car. Well, there's here's a little fact you might want to know about Hewitt. 
down in Warren Park, down over here in the playground, are some old merry-go-rounds. And they came out of what was the Waco Drive-In Theater. For those of you old enough to know, there's where they came, and this is where their home is. For those who are too young to know, come out and re-experience history here, a part of Waco. But I'd also like to turn your attention for a moment, if I could, over here, to Castleman Creek. And as you can see, the floodplains prevention, the water control, we don't just want the water to run in there because the, the worst thing you can do about water is allow it to pick up speed. As it picks up speed, that's where you get your most erosion from. And so, engineers, designers, and nature itself has designed the little ruts and, and uh, ripples you can see going down through here so that it slows the water down but still allows the water to leave the city and do it in a safe way so that it doesn't erode our whole countryside here. As you'll notice even on the bridges, there is a lot of concrete to slow the water down so that it doesn't erode and undermine the structures of everything. Yes, we even have another park across the street if you happen to come here across the Old Temple Road called Glaze Park when it's finally going to be finished. And that park was donated for the same reasons. This area was developed and there was some land that couldn't be used for that purpose but it is perfect to allow the environment to retain its natural state and let people have a way to come in and out and interact with having to, without having to drive 50 miles out in the countryside to find it. Parks are a wonderful place. No city should be without one. And every city that thrives has a park of one kind or another. Hewitt has been triply blessed in that we have two that have been developed already and one potential here. And so parks are an essential part for builders, for citizens, for cities, and for our environment. It allows our little animals to have a place to live and still call home. It allows our birds, trees to nest in. We still have some of the indigenous grasses and trees that are a part of this area, even back when it was in the 1800s and mainly just a flat black prairie. So, the next time you're in your park, have fun with your family. Have fun with your date, if that's what you choose to do, or have fun with whatever you're doing there. Take pictures, enjoy the playgrounds and everything, but remember, the little animals live there too, and we all live together. Tell you what, parks are a great place to be, but you know what? That's only one part of how a city impacts your environment. And so, tell you what, come along with me, and let's go to the next place so that you can see how your city changes and how the changes change you. So join me. Well, welcome to Rolling Hills, a subdivision of the city of Hewitt. I'm here at Glen Lee and Rolling Hills Drive. And we're gonna look at neighborhoods and see how they develop and how that impacts your environment for this environmental science class. Now if you'll look behind me, you'll notice that there's a road that goes up a hill it looks like. Because this is a, this subdivision is called Rolling Hills because it is Rolling Hills. And back in the beginning, there were a lot of places here where water could drain and we didn't have as many hard surfaces. Well the improved surfaces create a problem that causes flooding and it causes floodplains to be in here. Remember we talked about those a little bit in the park. So I want you to look behind me and notice that as the road goes up, if you'll look to the left hand side, you see what you know as a curb. The curbs are there to make it look pretty and pristine, yes, but it also keeps the water out in the middle of the road where it won't be all over everyone's home or in their front yards making a sloppy mess, so to speak. If you look to the right, you'll notice it's a different kind of curb. These are called a rural kind of curb setting. They're made different and they're designed different for a specific purpose. And their purpose is this. They allow more water to move faster and so that the water can drain quickly and move on to where it gets out of the way and it doesn't cause any damages. Now initially when Rolling Hills was built, a lot of it was not in the city. Developers tend to go out to the edge of the city sometimes in what's called the extraterritorial jurisdiction or the ETJ 
and they develop these housing markets. People want to buy them because the cost is a lot lower, but then you don't have as well the city control you might have if you were in an area where, say, the city got to regulate everything as it was being built. This edition of Hewitt originally had what was called septic tanks because everyone knows you got to have water coming in and you got to do something with it once it's polluted to get it out. So these houses were built on septic tanks and it was great because the septic tanks handled the problems and all. We're fortunate in Texas in this sense that it stays dry a lot because septic tanks work well. But 364 days of the year it's yippee. But one day it's oh my gosh. And oh my gosh means when it rained so much the ground became saturated. The septic tank as you know it is a big round concrete tank that is placed underground and the piping from the house goes in there, the sewer lines as it would be called, and it calls all of your wastewater, like from your washing machine, your dry uh, washing machines, your dishwasher, your sink, your bathtub, everything, and including your toilets, all that water goes down into the ground. And it collects there. And as it collects, there are lines that go off from it called lateral lines. These lateral lines go straight out and they split off from it and they form a base for the water to go out and slowly disperse. Then within the septic tank itself, sometimes they have to be pumped as they call it because the big pieces or the chunks as you would have it gather and collect in there to the point it stops it up. So great idea, worked great for hundreds of years, but then we realized there was a problem. So what was the problem? Well, the problem was the house at the top. The house at the top, if you'll look, cost $10,000 more than the house that was at the bottom. And how do I know this? Because I looked at buying a house myself here before I purchased the one that I did. And I couldn't figure it out. And then it came to me when a friend of mine bought a house where we found out why. Because when you're up at the top of the rolling hill, you're in a great spot even on rainy days because what they discovered were those lateral lines that came out were like soda straws and you know how two people can share the same drink with a soda straw well two septic tanks can handle the same drink with a soda straw only theirs went from the guy on top to the guy on the bottom to the guy on the bottom to the guy at the very bottom so not only did you have all the water run off there you had the soda straw effect there and so the house in the bottom a problem began what was the problem well the problem was this as the water began to collect and there was nowhere for it to go because you got rain runoff coming in you got sewers coming in as everyone started flushing their toilet well it all went somewhere and the water finds the lowest spot and the lowest spot was the lowest house at that time and so the only thing in there, and we will talk about this later, the difference between a water line and a sewer line is pressure. There's pressure on a water line so that the water can't back up. It has to go one direction. But a sewer line does not have that same luxury. And so when the water would collect down there, guess what? There's a nice bathtub that'll hold a lot of water. There's a nice toilet that's gonna help hold a lot of water because there's nothing there resisting it. So the house at the bottom became flooded and it came out into the house and it ruined the house and in some cases because a friend of mine bought one of these houses it actually impacted the walls and everything where he came home one day and a lot of his paneling had fallen over into the floor the water in there had actually leached up through the sheetrock and all and yes it was a mess is the only way to say it and so he discovered why his house cost a lot less than some of the others. This was a problem. It impacted the environment. It impacted people. And we had to do something about it. So what can we do? There's only one solution. We are not in a rural area. There's not enough land to absorb the water when it rains or, not, or even now when it dries. So the answer was we had to put them on a sewer line and build things like the new W. Mars plant. 
where it can be treated properly and things can be done to it it can be purified and so it can return to our environment without affecting us personally and without polluting our environment around us and so that's what we had to do we walked and even i and another man named bill tillman and brad's mom we walked and got a petition signed so that everyone here in rolling hills could be put on the sewer line and it was a lot of money that had to be spent to get the line here but it was for the benefit of the city it was a benefit of our environment and so it had to be done so we walked it and i'm not trying to champion my cause i'm saying people needed it and a lot of times you'll find when you go to buy your home you need to ask about these things because it's going to impact you and your family but also the places that loan the money because a lot of people didn't have like five thousand dollars to put this sewer line in and hook up well the places that had loaned them the money were more than happy to loan them some extra money because it enhanced the value of the house if you know your house and you're going to come home one night and be waiting in sewer you'll gladly pay a little more for that house and as you can see the homes behind me it only enhances your biggest asset you'll ever own the value of your home but more importantly it protects the health and well-being of your family by not polluting your environment so cities involved in the environment affect you the person more than you can imagine more so than just taking a test on what this unit's all about the city is the city because people want to be together and have all these things that they can work on because out in the country you couldn't afford to have your own treatment plant even if it was the best thing for your family no that's why cities develop that's why people want to live in them and that's why property values stay high now i want you to also notice that in this city we're looking at in rolling hills and give me a moment if you'll notice up where the curbing stops becoming the flat curbing and goes up higher that's where the storm drainage had been developed that's so the water can quickly get out of the rolling hills addition and move on down into what's called Bullhide Creek so they can move on eventually to the Brazos River and be absorbed in the river and, and taken out so that it's safe for everyone. Because you don't see any parks here, there's not that much floodplain. A lot of the houses could be developed because of the Rolling Hills effect. It allowed the water to move quickly and not pool so that places would loan money to build homes like you see behind us. But remember, when you buy your largest asset, think about your environment. Think about what's around you and think about the houses near you. Also, I want you to pay attention to one other thing. Look at these houses strongly because at our next stop, I'm going to bring another fact to you that you may not know. And it's going to be kind of a humorous story. So I want you to take a good look because it happened in this edition as well. There's nothing wrong with Rolling Hills edition. It's a great asset for the city of Hewitt. There's a tax base here. There's an environmental impact here. There is a solution here. And at the end of this lecture, I'm going to ask you a question. And it's going to involve two words. So be thinking about what it could be while we're looking at everything we've done. I have watched 30 years of development in this town. And this was a big part of one of them. So, having said that, why don't we go now and let me show you the next one and bring you a funny story in on it. And oh, by the way, just in case you were wondering, in Rolling Hills, two mayors have actually lived here. And this was family farms, remember. This is where they used to play and raise their families. There's a history book somewhere that paints a good light on this where someone rabbit hunted with their grandpa and he taught them how to shoot a shotgun or a 22 or whatever it was, it was he needed. It was a family environment and it still is because we have taken care of it. We have planned it out. We have allowed progress to come in and still not totally destroy the environment. So come along. Let's go see where our next stop takes us. So, welcome to Commerce Park, here in Hewitt, Texas. Now, Commerce Park is not like a city park. Commerce Park is for our businesses here. We have to develop areas for businesses to come in because it's important that a city have some businesses in there. 
it helps cut back on the tax rate for the homeowners and that's always a good thing but although that's a good thing there are some bad things that come along with it and these problems have to be worked out our businesses are important to us so what we have to do is see they require more water they require more sewer to be treated they require more electricity they have more resources that they have to have in order to develop their products and make their profits so that they can come in and pay the taxes that help our homeowners so that they don't have to pay as much but how do you control all of this do you allow business to just be in the middle of town anywhere no we came up with a solution, as everyone else did in the past, with zoning. And zoning is important to your environment for this reason. There are different kinds of zoning in the city of Hewitt. There is zoning for light industrial, manufacturing, commercial, and then there is what they call a controlled commercial. We have multifamily, and then finally, just regular old family homes like you were probably raised in, and like you one day will buy yourself if you don't already have one of those. The zoning is important because it allows things to develop in areas and it tells us how to future plan where all the resources would be needed. Because businesses do require more than just a regular homeowner. But of course they're willing to pay more for that. We have here in Commerce Park a nice commercial park and that's good because we're, we have plenty of land to develop for the businesses here. And zoning is critical because with zoning, it allows you to put, like, say, a manufacturing place here that would make a lot of noise and create more pollution next to an industrial area, which might be where things are warehoused, kind of like the Walmart warehouse where it isn't built there, but it's held until the store needs it. Then you have what's called light industrial, which would be maybe like a hotel or a motel or something on that order. And then you have the business line which is like your grocery stores your your gas stations and things like that that provide the services and of course offer you the things that you wish to have commodities for example then we have what's called a multi-family that's where you can have apartment houses because some folks can't afford the price of a home but they still want to live in a nice place so they could rent an apartment or they could rent a duplex or they could rent a triplex or a quadplex even in some places and then we have the homes that are usually used as rental homes. There is an area for those. And finally, there's what's called an R1 or a single family dwelling. And that's what most people in Hewitt have. Most of them have a single family dwelling where they raise their families. And it's the regular neighborhood that, well, like I grew up in and you grew up in too. It's important the city has all of this because it allows us to plan for the future and see how much we're going to need. How does that impact the environment, you ask me? Well, if we were manufacturing widgets here, but widgets needed iron ore, and widgets needed a lot of heat, and widgets needed a lot of water, and widgets needed a lot of just extra widgeting, the city would have to provide all those things if they wanted the businesses to locate here. But also in return, it would give people jobs, and it would cut down on our tax base. It is important that you have a commercial area. It is important that cities divide themselves through this zoning so that we can plan more for the infrastructure here. You'll probably notice if you could see them, there's some water towers around here because there's extra water needed. But also that extra water is a storage place for our homeowners as well. And the water is an extra storage place. So when we have droughts in Texas or something, we have extra water to come in and use so that things don't get overburdened sometimes. So you ask me about commercial parks, commercial parks are fine. They're not like going to the playground in the city park, of course, and they're not like going into a neighborhood park, maybe, if there were some. But Hewitt only has one true commercial park, and this is it. And so remember, zoning is critical because zoning is what keeps the people and the businesses and the environment like with our parks because the parks if you notice are not here in the business area they're over in the residential area it helps keep everything friendly there's a lot more runoff water that has to be dealt with here because businesses have a bigger footprint on the environment where they have maybe concrete where we have a driveway they have a parking lot where we have a home they have a building 
and of course it taxes our fire department too in that there may be two or three stories in a building that would not be there in a home. So resources have to be available. So you know what? Zoning is critical. Zoning affects your environment, but it does it in a good and sometimes not a good way, but it all works together so that the big picture, as they say, turns out to be beautiful and benefit everyone. So that's what we talk about when we come to our commercial park, which there's land here. If some of you entrepreneurs want to come build, we'll be glad to talk to you. Catch me after class, you might say. i tell you what, we're going to move on now and see what happens if maybe you do a little, as they say, trash talk or something. We'll see what comes up. Come on and join me. So, welcome to the Hewitt. Ritchie Road well site and where we have our trash pickup. Hewitt in the beginning didn't have anyone picking up the trash except for a couple that had lived here for free many 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 years and they were named the Cliftons and it was an elderly couple and the elderly couple had a couple of trash trucks and when I say elderly they were probably in their late 60s early 70s and you have to remember it was the two of them going out and collecting the trash. Well, in Hewitt that was great, except there were some problems that came up. And the problems that came up were this. The couple didn't really keep records as well as I guess they should have or could have. Well, at that time, they didn't have computer available. So they would charge a nominal fee to come get your trash, two or three dollars a month. And what would happen was some of the neighbors got together. And let's say we had a neighborhood that had 12 houses, six on either side of the street. And the neighbors came up with this creative idea that, well, I'd pay for January. My neighbor next door would pay for February. Uh, you'd pay for March. Uh, Mr. Turner would pay for April. And you get the picture. Everyone would put their trash in my yard if it was my month to pay. And then they put the trash in the other yard. Now, although there wasn't a law in the book saying you can't do that, it really wasn't right. And this couple worked hard for it. But there wasn't a whole lot anyone could do. And of course, they suffered for it a little bit. Well, if you remember when we were talking about Rolling Hills, there was an interesting story, and I told you I was going to tell you a good one about it. There was an interesting story that came about out there. And the story was this. There was a young man that had rented a house in the area. He was single, and he sublet it to five of his friends. So there's like six guys living in this house. And the six guys decided they needed to have their trucks out there. So they can't put them all in the driveway, obviously. So what they did was they lined them up across the front yard, just like you had them for sale in a car. All they needed was the signs out front. Well, what happened then was the neighbors began to complain because it not only being an eyesore, ruining the yard, I mean, it's just, it's just not the right thing to do. So, there was a law that said you could not park in your front yard because your front yard wasn't there as a parking lot. If you had it paved or if you had it improved, that would be fine. But this one didn't. It was just a standard single-family home. So when the neighbors complained, the police came out and told them they would have to not park their trucks like that anymore. And so this angered this young man and his friends. And so they, okay, we're going to do a tit-for-tat for the neighbors. And so what happened was we had people that were buying houses in Rolling Hills and all over Hewitt. A lot of them young couples and everything. And remember our topics about trash. And so there wasn't a law in the books that said you have to, have, you have to pay a trash pickup. So what happened was as the trash accumulated, there was nowhere for them to take it. Hewitt doesn't have a landfill. Landfills are owned by private entities, and they take care of them. Now, some cities have them. But primarily, it's private entities that have them. They are for profit. They're not a non-profit. And they're regulated heavily by the state and our friends at the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. So, what could we do? Well, the problem was the trash is building up. All these new homes that have been built since probably the 1970s and on have one unique feature about them, and that's a fireplace. And what do you do with a fireplace? You burn things in it. You're already ahead of me, aren't you? Yes, they started burning their trash in their fireplaces. Buying new homes and burning trash in them like it was some kind of a 
garbage dump, which in fact, that's what it was. The problem wasn't so much they burned some of the stuff in there, though the embers get out and that could be a fire hazard and all, and not to mention the liability. But the problem was the young families had young children and young children create, <laughs> you're already ahead of me again, aren't you? Dirty diapers. I tell you what, I'll talk Mr. Turner into giving you an extra two points on your final grade if you'll go out to the lake and build you a nice fire and put you about four or five dirty diapers in there. I'm talking about with the good stuff in it and stay uh, uh, downwind of it for more than about 20 minutes without passing out. Yeah, you get the picture. It wasn't a good picture. It wasn't a clear thing. It wasn't anything good in a new home. It really destroyed part of the value. Not only for that home, but the homes in the, in the area. So, the tit for tat comes back. The guy that couldn't park his truck starts complaining about the guy burning his baby's diapers. Now, the guy said, but I burned them all up. Well, but there were tin cans that wouldn't burn. There are things in there that would not burn, and they've been burying that in the backyard. So we've got air pollution. We've got pollution where they're burying these metals that may have been burned that have a chemical coating on them that could react with our environment. We have dirty diapers. We, it's just, it's getting out of hand. So what do you do? Well, you pass a law that says it is mandatory now that everyone has to have their trash picked up. And that was a good thing. But it could be better. Because the trash pickup worked out great. We made it mandatory so that the Clifton's didn't have to pick up everybody's trash for one payment a year out of them. The city took over the responsibility of making sure the trash was picked up. But the city didn't have a place to take it and didn't have trash trucks and everything. Remember I told you, that's contracted by a private entity. And they do it as a business profession. Just like people building cars or bringing groceries to the market or whatever, there is a cost involved. Now the odd facts you may find is that a city's landfill, or the closest one to it, because the closest one here is Waco, doesn't necessarily mean that's where your trash goes. In fact, in Hewitt, with the contracts we have, it doesn't go to Waco. It goes to other places, miles and miles away. So that you can't just assume your trash will be picked up and taken to the closest place. Now the reason you can't assume that is because first of all, it's not owned by Hewitt. It's owned by a private company. Secondly, to put a trash dump site in like that, it's millions of dollars because it has to have a hole dug in the ground. It has to be lined with clay. I mean, there are regulations from our friends at the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality that issue licenses for this so it's inspected so that it doesn't pollute our groundwater, it doesn't pollute the ground around it, it doesn't pollute our air, because all of them, if you know, after they get covered, build up a methane gas in there. And that could be deadly if it collected. Or, like you've seen in the news sometimes, a house just explodes. Well, you don't want a landfill to explode. Not only do you not want the damage it would cause, you don't want what it would scatter all over your town. So there are reasons why your trash has to be picked up and it has to be done in a certain way. As you can see behind me are two big dumpsters. These are used to take the overload where people come in on a Saturday that may need to get rid of some extra things that they pay for. It's part of the service that's provided for us. But just because Waco has the landfill doesn't mean those two dumpsters are going to go to Waco. They go where Hewitt has had a contract with a private company to go and take care of our trash. Now the next problem comes around. We're filling them up too quickly. These trash, these trash landfills are filling up entirely too quickly. So what is the solution to the problem, Mr. Turner? I was even asked that. I said simple, recycling. Recycling. Paper can be recycled. Aluminum can be recycled. Tin can be recycled. There are a lot of things in your trash you throw out and take for granted that could be recycled. If you're smart, you can collect your tin cans, your paper and stuff. And if you get enough, what's it worth to you? Well, you could be digging the old pocket and pulling out money to take your date out tonight. Or maybe this weekend. Or to pay for whatever it is you might want to do, or perhaps to just buy your next hamburger. Hey, feed yourself. Money. Money is, a, is valuable because they can take, I'll use an example like the aluminum cans. 
it's one of my favorite facts I learned when I was in learning all of this. To create that aluminum can costs a certain amount. Let's say it costs a dollar to create it. To recycle it only takes five cents. Five cents, and it's not in our landfill. And it's not polluting our environment. Because if it was, we would have to go dig out the new ore. We would have to have this huge process that goes about. This can be smelted down, reformed in, and reused. Five cents versus a dollar. Which would you rather spend? Which would you rather have coming out of your pocket? Not to mention, if you get enough of these aluminum cans together, uh, I know at one time they were up to 50 cents a pound. You can be paid to take them in so they can recycle them, and you save, 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 and get paid for saving. A win-win combination. Now, we like to think about that because we have to realize that landfills are filling up, number one. Number two, trash has to be picked up. But all the trash doesn't have to be put in the landfill. Most of it, if you'll look at what you have in your trash can, I will be willing to bet you 75 to 80% of it can be recycled. So only 20% needs to go out there. So a landfill that had 20 years with full impact might have 40 years if we all learn to recycle, and that keeps the cost down for them. Now, while we're here, I wanted to point out one other thing to you. Can you see these pipes laying on the ground? Remember, we talked about over Rolling Hills two things. There are sewer pipes and there are water pipes. Water pipes and sewer pipes are different in one way. Anyone care to guess? Come on, give me a guess. Huh? You may have gotten it, you may not. It is pressure. Water must be put under pressure before it comes into your home. That's why the big metal looking pipes are so thick wool. They're iron and they're thick because there's a lot of pressure against them to force that water to come into your house. And you say, well, why do you have to put so much pressure on it? Because we don't want anything in the environment coming into your drinking water. Once it's been purified, once it's been put up here in our tower, once it's been purified and it comes to your house, we do not want to have any kind of contaminants in there that could make you sick or create a problem for your family. Water is a precious commodity. You can live without food longer and you can live without water. And water is a very valuable commodity for the state of Texas as well because there's not an endless supply of it. There is enough to meet our needs if we take care of it and watch for the future. See the white pipe? The white pipe is like a sewer pipe. Notice how thin the walls are on it because it doesn't have pressure on it. We don't want anything in there coming out. We want everything in there to stay in it. And so that pipe isn't as thick as the other pipe. It isn't metal, if you'll notice. It is plastic because it can be done that way. The other thing was we had once in Hewitt, we wanted to find out how much was getting into our sewer lines because to pay for water runoff that's just rainwater is very expensive. And anything that goes in a sewer pipe has to be treated as you can find if you ever go out and look at what's called the W.W. W. Morris plant. It's a new treatment plant. Go see a sewer treatment plant and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Go visit one. If you don't even get to go in and see it, just drive by and you'll understand. It's a very expensive process to purify water. But anything that goes in that sewer pipe under our friends at the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality has to be treated. So we ran what was called an INI. &I. It stood for infiltration and inflow which meant we were finding out how much water was seeping in from rainwater and other places that had to be treated like it was coming out of your toilet. And that's expensive where the rainwater wasn't going to have to be treated as well. And we found when we started monitoring this, they filled up all the pipes with the smoke. And even though we handed out flyers, we had people calling in the city all saying, Oh my God, you it's on fire, I'm seeing smoke coming up out of the ground. They must have thought that we had a... Uh, a volcano breaking out or, or someone was underground burning up everything or our coal mines had finally caught on fire which no one even knew we had coal mines because we don't. But the INI showed us where the holes were in the system so it could be taken care of because the smoke comes out and the smoke comes out very thickly. So we fixed all of that and what we found and discovered was a huge percentage, I think it was like 25 or 30 percent of what was being put in, what was seeping into our lines before we had them repaired and fixed was actually wasn't necessary to have to go through a sewer treatment plant. So we were able to cut some of the expense that way. 
So keep in mind one thing. There's one word that tells you the difference between a water pipe and a sewer pipe. And what's that one word? Pressure. You have pressure on a water pipe. You do not have it on a sewer pipe. And go out sometime and take a look at them. Or walk through your neighborhood Lowe's or plumbing place or whatever and look at the difference in a water pipe and a sewer pipe. And you'll understand what I mean. I appreciate you being out here with me this afternoon. And I tell you what, we're going to move on and do some other things as well. So come on and join me. we got some more things to learn about Hewitt, how cities impact the environment and everything. You're doing great, and we're almost there. So don't doze off on me. Hey, you, wake up. So, here we are, in front of the Hewitt Depot, one of the oldest buildings left in Hewitt, Texas. There's one other building in our town. The Hewitt Depot was built back in the 1800s, and it sat in this very spot for many, many years. And then, when it was no longer functional for the MKT out here, the railroad that comes through town, it was sold. And it was moved out near Interstate 35 and sat out in the field for many, many years. And then it was sold from that area and moved to an area over near Woodway where it sat for many years as well. But while it was in Woodway, it caught on fire and this beautiful building was almost totally destroyed. We had a group that got together that was called the Repo the Depot. And we went over and reclaimed our depot and we brought it back over here and we raised the funds and we had all kinds of things going on in Hewitt to get money so that we could restore what is one of the only two buildings left in this town that was original. And that is the Hewitt Depot behind me. So we brought it here and we restored it and as fate would have it, we even got to put it back in the same place it came from. And we're very proud of it because it is the home of the Greater Hewitt Chamber of Commerce. And as you can see, they do a very fine job taking care of it for us. There's a couple of other fun things you might want to know about Hewitt. And they are, Hewitt is 10.3 square miles. And we are landlocked on all three, four sides, I should say because we can't grow any bigger than we are right now. Hewitt's as big as it's ever gonna be. And why? Because the city limits of other towns keep us from moving out any further. Hewitt's average citizen is a mere 33 years old. Now, obviously, he's younger than I am. And did you know another fact about Hewitt is most of the structures in this town, out of all of them, if you add them up together, 82.2% of those are single family homes. And that's a nice thing. The tax rate here, though it's not the lowest tax rate in the county, there's a misconception that we're the most expensive place. But if you took your tax bill and looked at the city's taxes, you would realize that we don't have the lowest rate, but because we still implement the homestead exemption, we pay one of the lowest rates. And that's what counts. It's not how much you're charged, it's what you gotta pay at the counter. Also, you probably didn't know this, but Hewitt had a high school. Yes, three-story high school. They used to sit down on land, and I'd love to take you there and show it to you, but it is not there any longer. It was built in 1921. You'll go to the corner of First and Wall Street. There is a piece of concrete there with brick around it. It has Hewitt High School cut into it. But if you'll walk around to the back, you'll see in big letters, 1921, or I should say big numbers, right? And that's where it used to sit. Now there are duplexes there. Also, Hewitt was a community that was agricultural mainly, and there was only one lumber yard there. Just one. And a lot of the folks here who had the original homes got their land sold to them if they 
promised to buy their lumber from the lumber yard because his family controlled most of the land. Nothing wrong with that. It's just that's what you had to do. But you know what? <laughs> if you're dying to get into Hewitt, don't do it here. Because Hewitt's one of the sm only small towns that does not have a cemetery. I mean, we don't have one open today. We don't have one that was open back then. Hewitt does not have a cemetery. The closest one is Waco Memorial Park out near Interstate 35. So, in the years I have lived here, and I've lived here over 30-something years, I've watched Hewitt grow. I've seen what's happened in Hewitt. I've seen people come and go, and I've watched things get better. So, what do you think is important? I can tell you what's important. The amount of money it costs you to move into a place, the resources that are available for you, the things that you need for your life that are controlled by the city government. There's two things you need to remember, and it's my slogan. There are two ways to handle your problems, no matter if it's personal or the city or a church or whatever, even the school that you're attending. You can be proactive and plan for things and plan out the future so that things go well. Or you can react and be reactive, which is always more expensive. It was reactive to have to go find our building, rebuild it, take care of the damage, move it. You know, the cost was astronomical, but worth it because we preserved the history. It would have been better if they'd have had a proactive thing that just brought it back here and set it up for us. Proactive is always best. You also need to remember another thing. You can get to know your local officials, and your local officials affect you more than the national government does. Believe it or not, the national government may take more of your money, but the local people, in they're the ones who control your life more. And there's one thing you can do to make sure that your life's a good life, that your life has quality life, that your environment is protected. Because all the things that happen that affect you as an individual happen right here. Not in Washington, D.C., not in Austin, Texas for our capital. It all happens here. And how do you control all of that as an individual? Well, you can't just come up to City Hall and tell them, do it. You're not the general running the army. But your vote on election day for who you put in there totally changes what does or does not happen to you. Environmental science, environmental, the environment, however you want to phrase it. And local government, what have they got to do with each other? Everything. Everything in your life is affected by those. So, make sure the people that run your city, make sure the people that you have there are looking out for you and looking out for your environment. Recycling, water, sewer, zoning. Remember all the things we've talked about. Because every one of them, it's like putting a puzzle together. Yes, you can still have a puzzle without it, but without the piece, you don't see the whole picture. And it's not something you'd want to have. Well, that pretty much sums it up for me, Charlie Turner, and I've served many, many years with Hewitt. Remember, I was elected the first time in 1981 before my son was even born, actually. But I want to tell you, I appreciate you being with me here. If it's late at night, hey, grab you some coffee if you gotta stay awake, or catch you some sleep before you have to be up in the morning. So I'm gonna say bye and wrap my part up now, and we'll let Brad come back and talk to you and conclude your lab here. So thanks, folks. Welcome to Hewitt. Come see me sometime. I bet you forgot I was even here, didn't you? That's right. Well, I have been. I've been running the camera. But there's a couple of things I want to add real, really quickly about Hewitt. I'm just kind of proud of this place, too. Though we also tour lots of places around Waco. But Hewitt was actually ranked in Money Magazine in 2007 and 2009 as one of the top 100 places to live in the country. I gotta say, that's most impressive. I have students who will say, 
why don't we look at how Hewitt compares to other cities? And they'll ask me, why don't we do a lab where we go and compare Hewitt with other cities? Well, for one thing, we're probably already staring down a nice long video right now. And I figure that's enough to answer your 20 questions. But we do. We talk about Waco, and we give you a little bit of a show of what Waco looks like and what a bedroom community, suburbia, like Hewitt looks like. There's a couple things that I want to ask you. Do you think that the environment is better off now than, say, a hundred years ago? Here in Hewitt, are things better? Well, that's a tricky one to answer because things are better and that it's more sustainable for humans. We're more likely to be able to live here because we have more houses to live in. We have more jobs, availability, we have a network to bring in food and supplies. But it's also not necessarily a good thing because every person, every person that's moved in, like my dad said, 82.2% .2 of them are living in houses and each one of them wants a quarter acre to half acre lot. All of which used to be Blackland Prairie. All the indigenous species that used to live here, sure, we're not talking about some beautiful place you'd want a vacation, but still, all the little friends that used to live here can't live here anymore because my house is sitting where they used to. In my yard alone, I have tons and tons of rabbits. Rabbits all over the place. And that's because those rabbits have always lived in that area, even after my house was built. You see, when, I, when my house was put in, all the little friends that used to live there no longer had a place. And they can go to parks and whatnot, but kids also go to parks. It's tricky. The thing is, we now have more grassland, and houses also have trees. You're looking at anywhere from 10 to 20 trees that might get added to some people's lots. And that's nice and all, but the problem is, this is the Blackland Prairie. And the Blackland Prairie isn't supposed to have a lot of trees on it. It's supposed to have a lot of grasses on it. But people don't like a lot of grasses. And the kind that they do is like St. Augustine, which is invasive. Bermuda, which is from Bermuda. The kind of grasses that we have here are more what people consider weeds. They're the things that they try to pull. So is it better? Yes. We have more greenery. We have more trees. But it's not necessarily good because that isn't, that isn't what this biome was. This is a grassland. It's better because we now have more flood control. But a hundred years ago that wouldn't have mattered because nobody was here. Anyway, I just want to go ahead and wrap that up and let you see just a handful of the ways that cities and the environment correlate. So if you have any questions, feel free to message me or if there's anything that you feel was left off. Uh, otherwise, I want to say thanks again to my dad for doing this for me. I think you now understand why I wanted him to be the one to do it. And keep living that dream and fighting that power because no one's going to live it or fight it for you. And I'll see you again soon. Bye.